Well, good morning, good morning, everybody. A little bright this morning at a uh, nice crisp negative five outside. Uh, hopefully, prayerfully, you guys have your cups of coffee. Cheers. Chink. And then you also have your Bibles, pens, paper, highlighters. As we continue our study of systematic theology, looking at aspects of faith this morning, part two, what is faith? What are its aspects and how does that play out in time? With that, no, no more of my mug this morning, at least for this class, as we continue on in systematic theology. With that, uh, we continue this morning. I know it's a little early, but such is the schedule today. As we talk about faith in the New Testament and continuing to look at it, is an intellectual belief or conviction resting on the testimony of another and therefore based in trust on this other rather than personal investigation, and especially in the writings of John and in Philippians, Second Corinthians, and Thessalonians by Paul. This belief or conviction resting on the testimony of another. Well, in the case of the Bible, in the case of New Testament faith, that that testimony is of Jesus Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection, that our intellectual belief and connection in that not only historical fact, but the testimony of Christ himself at post his resurrection and the eyewitnesses thereof. And then we talk about confiding and trusting and having confidence in God, or more particularly in Christ with a view of redemption from sin and of future blessedness. Also, especially in the epistles of Paul and many other passages. This second type of faith is confiding trust or confidence in God. Much as the analogy is often made of you trust the chair that you're sitting in. You're trusting that the four legs or however it's designed is able to hold your weight. You're, you're trusting, you're confiding that it will hold your weight in the same way that we trust and confide in Christ that he, his death, burial, and resurrection is enough, more than enough, to save our wretched hides. So as we start looking at, what in the world? Sorry, folks. Computers being interesting. As we start talking about the language of faith in the New Testament, what words are being used when we discuss faith? It's spoken of as a looking to Jesus. Uh, specifically in John 3. We'll look at that passage here in just a moment. But that language is appropriate. Let, in fact, let's take a look at it. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. So when we look at John chapter 3, and the incident of Moses lifting up the serpent in the wilderness, what is it that saved the people in the wilderness looking to the brazen serpent or the bronze serpent trusting in the fact that in looking to it and in trusting that they would be saved in the same way jesus makes the parallel that he too must be lifted up and that whoever looks to him just as they look to the serpents would have eternal life this language is appropriate because it compresses various elements of faith. There is in it an act of perceptual, in other words, an intellectual element. This idea of intellectually assenting that God exists, that God has sent his son, that God has provided his son for to provide salvation for mankind. All these intellectual things, looking at him, the historical aspects of it and, the, and assenting to the, yes, this actually physically happened at a certain space and time in human history. A deliberate fixing of the eye on the object. In other words, this is the volitional, using your own 
not just cognition, but your own will to fix your eyes upon the cross. To fix your eyes upon the cross, to combine what you understand is truth, what you understand as the reality, and combining it with what you see, what you feel. And in some aspects, as we look at the certain satisfaction which this concentration testifies, in other words, the emotional aspect of it, if, if in fact this reality is true for you and true in a general sense, then you find satisfaction in believing, satisfaction in faith. So perception, you're fixing upon, in this case, the cross, Christ, putting faith and trust in him, and then finding satisfaction emotionally, spiritually, with the fact that you have placed your faith and trust in him. This looking to Jesus is a common phrase used by many preachers. And correctly so. If Jesus makes the connection with the bronze serpent in himself, and in both instances using the description of looking to him, not just merely seeing, but in fact trusting, believing, having faith, pistis in that action. In another way, when we look at the language of faith in the New Testament, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. What type of language are we seeing used here by the Lord himself to describe faith, trust in what God is doing, has done, and will do for us? That there's a blessing that comes from those who thirst and hunger for righteousness. Now, is this a literal thirst as I am partaking of my coffee this morning and as I already had my, my protein shake for breakfast? No. This is a spiritual hunger and thirst. This is a spiritual need that can only be filled through faith. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that the one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I give will give for the life of the world is my flesh. So yesterday I was listening to a debate on uh, the Eucharist, in other words, communion. And unfortunately, the Roman Catholic Church is stealing of the Greek term Eucharisteo, and um, in many ways, the degradation of that term of thanksgiving. The very fact is, is that when we look at John chapter 6, Jesus says many important things in, in John chapter 6 regarding salvation. But as he gives this language of himself being that bread, being the very promise in which when we look at the Sermon on the Mount that blessed are those that are hunger and thirst after righteousness and that Jesus is the one who provides the bread and the cup to fulfill that righteousness is not speaking of a, a communion that literally becomes the body and blood of Christ. These are, are metaphors. These are similes. These are language being used to draw practical, real-life understanding of what's going on, the fact that we do physically hunger, we do physically thirst, but making the parallel to spiritual realities and the fact that we do spiritually hunger and thirst and only God can fulfill that need. We cannot just go to the store and by spiritual bread or spiritual drink. Neither can the mere elements of communion satisfy the spiritual need of bread and drink. 
They are a anamnesis, a remembrance of what Christ has done. But in the same way as the Corinthians used the Passover, used communion as a chance to be gluttonous and to drink too much wine, in the same way many churches present uh, this type of remembrance as the physical body and blood of Christ. And as we're going to look at church history, this issue is going to be coming up again this morning, looking at the same passage and and looking at its application in the, the life of an early reformer. In John chapter 6, Jesus continues, The Jews disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? That's a great question. Actually, this is not necessarily them showing a lack of faith. They understand very well the prohibition in the law against the cannibalization of other humans. It was forbidden in the law. You were not allowed to drink of the blood of animals or another human, nor were you allowed to eat the flesh of another human. Cannibalism was taboo verboten. It was not done. And this was a command from the Lord. Would the Lord call us to violate a commandment in which he has already given us? A legitimate question that as they discussed. So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. And I will raise him up on the last day. The third time, by the way, in this passage that Jesus discusses raising them up. Those who put faith and belief in him on the last day. The promise of the resurrection. The very thing as he talks to the woman at the well uh, about that he is the resurrection and the life. See, here Jesus is being graphic to be graphic. Jesus is being very blunt about what it takes to hunger and thirst after him, being willing to uh, partake in his remembrance, being going after him, and that it has a cost to count the cost. For my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Okay, here we go. Here's the fulfillment of what Jesus was calling the people to do in the Sermon on the Mount is the fulfillment of hungering and thirsting after righteousness is and through him. For his flesh, his body is true food to fulfill our spiritual hunger. The blood is true drink to fulfill the spiritual thirst. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever feeds on me, he will also live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread the fathers ate, speaking of the manna that was brought down from heaven, and they died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. So Jesus clearly makes the distinction. That's why it's highlighted and underlined here for your benefit. That the physical bread of manna that the forefathers ate in the desert was physical. It had substance. It had reality. It filled their stomachs. But Jesus is saying that the bread that he gives, the bread that came down from heaven himself, is not like that bread in which they ate and died. That this bread that Jesus gives will live forever. It is not the same. It is parallel. It is similar. And yet it is vastly different. That phrase, not like the bread the fathers ate, 
not like the manna that came down from heaven. It is important in our discussion, not only of this language of faith in the New Testament, but of our discussion of what is communion. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will come become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Now, as a kid that grew up in church, I've got a river of life flowing out of me, spring up a well, splish, splash, in my soul. Yes, you can tell. One too many vacation Bible schools and Sunday schools for me. But it's certainly true that this water that is being given, this language of, of faith and satisfaction of the, the spiritual needs of mankind, creates something that the mere physical water nor the mere physical food cannot do. If I drink this cup of coffee, it does not create a mini coffee pot inside me that continually provides coffee eternally. No, the type of drink that Jesus is offering is something that satisfies the spiritual, not with something physical, but with something spiritual. You notice also as we discuss Jesus' ministry, many times as he's feeding them spiritually, he will feed them physically. I'll say that again. Many times throughout the New Testament, especially when we see the feeding of the thousands, that they are fed both spiritually in the words of Jesus and physically with such as the loaves and the fishes. Um, in fact, we were talking about that this, this Wednesday at, at youth group. We were playing some Bible Jeopardy, and one of the questions was this, you know, how many loaves and fishes? And um, one of the high schoolers quickly was repeating, hey, Sheldon, glad you could join us, was repeating a, a song that we do in release time in Milesville. Um, one basket, two fish, five loaves of barley bread. And there's a, song, a whole song that goes with that. And so one of the high schoolers in, in, in the process of answering the question starts singing the song. And I couldn't help but laugh because the, the importance of remembering these stories, remem remembering these truths are often contained in our kids in and through songs. But once again, Jesus fulfills both a physical and a spiritual need in the same period of time as he did with the feeding of the thousands. As we look at this language of faith in the New Testament, it represented a hungering or a thirsting, an eating and a drinking. As we saw in John chapter 6 in Matthew uh, chapter 5. When men really hunger and thirst spiritually, they feel that something is wanting. Our conscience of the indispensable character of that which is lacking and endeavor to obtain it. This is a characteristic of the activity of faith, but it's also a characteristic of in the process of salvation. That once a person is regenerated, this hunger is presented inside of them. This, this hunger, this desire pushes them forward into receiving of faith and repentance. That a man, before he is regenerated, does not hunger or thirst spiritually. It is, in fact, oblivious to that need. But when they hunger and thirst spiritually is because the Spirit of God has moved in them, removed a heart of stone and given them a heart of flesh. Now that heart of flesh desires the things of God, desires and hungers and thirsts spiritually for that bread and drink that only 
Christ can give. These analogies, these similes that Jesus presents are perfect and they describe exactly the, the spiritual process that occurs in mankind, the spiritual process that occurred with me, even at a young age, of not understanding what regeneration is, but understanding the effects of it and hungering and thirsting after righteousness, hungering and thirsting after who God is, hungering and thirsting after his word. And, and being in his word then convicted me of sin convicted me of righteousness in and through the Spirit, which then brought me to, to place faith and trust in Christ. This marriage between the, the work of the Spirit, regeneration, the gifts of faith and repentance is abundantly clear in Scripture. In eating and drinking, we not only have the conviction and the necessary food and drink is present, but we also, but also the constant expectation that it will satisfy us. Just as in appropriating Christ by faith, we have a certain measure of confidence that he will save us. When I was regenerated as a preteen, that I under, then understood my desire for the things of God would satisfy this need. Unlike so often the physical desire for food and for drink can lead to something that is never satisfied. It can lead to an unnatural uh, wantonness or desire that creates gluttony or in the same turn creates alcoholism or in the same turn creates a, a wino, as we say. But the spiritual reality of the same type of hunger is that, in fact, Christ will satisfy. The word will satisfy that as we hunger and thirst after him, that we continually feed ourselves spiritually. The big problem is, is that many may be regenerate, may have this hunger or thirst, but never get to the, the point of realizing that in putting their faith and trust in Christ, that he is the spiritual bread and spiritual drink and truly having that confidence that he will both satisfy and save us. That is why, unfortunately, uh, as the way I was brought up in church, that there was a, a lacking spiritually that people would have this desire but think that it is satisfied in and through experience and experience only. And not just any type of experience, a wild, um, abandoned, um, the best way to, to put it is a, a spiritual high experience with God. It was their explanation of the only way to fulfill this desire for spiritual food and spiritual drink. But that constantly wanting a spiritual high led them to being spiritually malnourished. The, their neglecting of the word, their neglecting of feeding themselves spiritually, instead always after a spiritual experience with God, led to anemic and very spiritually malnourished individuals. People that always desired more but could not get enough. That then the addiction wasn't on Christ and his work. 
in him being the bread, in him being the cup, in in him being there the fulfillment and the satisfaction of that desire. Instead, they continually consumed experience without finding contentment, continually going after ex- spiritual or religious experiences without doing, as Burkhoff says here, appropriating Christ by faith and having confidence that he will save us and in that same confidence expecting that he will satisfy us. This, whether you want to call it spiritual immaturity, whether you want to call it um, denominational bias, unfortunately led to a lot of people not truly understanding who God is and his relationship with us. Many people coming to church, quote unquote, expecting God to move when God has moved, is moving, and will continue to move, but not in and through the demanding of spiritual experiences. This is, This unfortunate adolescence many Christians don't grow out of. That just as when you're a child, and especially in my case, at first you might grow to expect when you go to grandma and grandpa's house that grandma and grandpa are going to have a surprise for you, whether it be a toy or candy. or. But then you start to grow up and realize that it's not the toy or the candy that you desire. It's the actual visiting of grandma and grandpa, seeing grandma and grandpa. That yes, sometimes there might be, you know, they might spoil you a little bit, but not expecting that every time. In the same way, we grow in Christ and not expecting a supernatural high but instead looking forward to the, as we call it, the communion or the relationship or the fellowship with Christ that we look forward to in the church service, not in the worship of him, not in a any particular spiritual high. That whether it's a spiritual high or a spiritual low, that we can be like David and sing of his praises no matter our current physical, mental, or spiritual situation. That we are confident that he will satisfy us no matter what. What's not described here by by Burkhoff, and, and purposely, I think, absent, is the qualifier of emotional, spiritual, or physical situation that despite those events in our life, despite those situations, good, bad, or indifferent, that our constant expectation is that Jesus will satisfy us and that he has, in fact, saved us. That this faith that we put in him comes with that constant expectation to have communion and fellowship with him, but not the supernatural experience. Also in the language of faith of the New Testament, Jesus says, yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. His using of the term come. When he calls his boys, the disciples, many times he used come, follow me, come, come here. Often used as a, a command. Yet, Jesus says, you refuse to come to me that you may have life. There's, as we looked at, hey, Pastor X, good good morning there in, in SoCal, it being uh, 7.30 there in the morning. Hopefully you got your workout and your carrot juice. 
But here, it's not a command here in John 5. Jesus is remarking that their refusal to come to him, even though he has called for them, even though the call is always there, even 2,000 years later that pulpits across America this Sunday are going to give a call to come to Christ, yet many refuse to come to him that they may have eternal life. In this same type of language, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Looking at John 7, 37 and 38. That the process of coming to him, being drawn of the Father, John chapter 6. We often chalk that up to human will and perseverance. But realizing that only his sheep hear his voice and only they come to him. Not the goats. Not the many other descriptors of those who will not, cannot, nor ever will they believe. I would not, could not in a boat. I would not, could not in a moat. Uh, you know, going back to uh, green eggs and ham. Well, that's the, the spiritual reality. That many out there will not come to him. And for them to drink and to eat of the bread that he gives. And to receive then the rivers of living water, a spring welling up inside of them, that they would not receive that. Is a spiritual reality that we have to understand and accept that some in whom we pray for, in whom we minister to, will not come. Sad as it is, in some ways rather depressing, but it's a spiritual reality nonetheless. So even more important, it is that as we understand that this command to come goes out. And yet, as Jesus says in John 6, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. This is going to rub a lot of you the wrong way. Not my fault. The scripture is what's robbing you the wrong way. Straight out of the horse's mouth. Straight out of the Lord's mouth himself. No one. that No one is, escapes that qualifier. All of humanity fits within this qualifier. That not a single person outside of this operation of God can thwart this plan. That no one can come to Christ unless the Father draws him. So that those that, in fact, when we looked at John 7, come to Jesus are then drawn by the Father. No one. Not, no one can come. That's a qualifier. That no one can have the ability to come to the Father, to come to Christ, unless the Father draws him. You may call this all different types of spiritual names, but it's a spiritual reality. That until I was regenerated, until I was given the gifts of faith and repentance, I could not come to Jesus. Now, did I understand that at the moment? No. All I understood is what God was doing. And yet, this spiritual reality, we have to understand that in our churches, this Sunday, the call will go out. But unless the Father draws them to the message, draws them to placing faith and trust in Christ, is only the work of the Father drawn. And the great promise 
as we mentioned three times in John 6, and I will raise him up on the last day. Who is that? The one in whom the Father is drawn. Not all. Not all will be raised up to, to eternal life. Not all will be raised up incorruptible. As we see elsewhere in Scripture that some will be raised up to eternal life and some will be raised up to condemnation, to suffering, to eternal conscious torment. But more importantly, before we get to eschatological ideas, that no one can come, this language of faith, no one can come, place their faith and trust in me unless the Father who sent me draws him. I don't care how religious terms you want to put into it. I don't know. I don't care how many times you play just as I am. I don't care how many times the organ player keeps playing while you have an altar call, quote unquote, unless they have been drawn by the Father, will then someone make a credible profession of faith? Of truly having repentance of truly having sorrow for their sin and placing their full trust, expectation, and desire into Christ. But all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. All whom the Father gives, the Son will raise up. And all whom the Father gives, they will receive him, and they become the children of God. Oh, you mean, Pastor Chris, that not everybody's a child of God? Nope. Not everybody's a child of God. No matter what Oprah says, no matter what TV or the internet or the radio says, we are not all the children of God. Only those who received him, believed and trusted in his name, whom in John 6, Jesus says that the Father draws, that here the Father gives them the right, the responsibility, the delegated authority to become the children of God. To become something means that before you were not. That before Christ, we were not the children of God. We were, in fact, the children of the devil. We were under the prince of the power of the air. We were in the kingdom of darkness, and we became the children of God. We became the children of light. We entered into the kingdom of light. So this totally smashes the relativistic presentation that we're all just morally neutral and that we just need to kind of give a nudge towards God to take that other little step to become becoming righteous and holy. No, 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 no. That until God draws, until we're given the gifts of faith and repentance and receive the supernatural work of regeneration, that after we receive him and believe in his name, then then and only then we become the children of God. Stop playing this mess that some of those that are in the pews, oh, we're all just the children of God. No. Some, even this Sunday, sitting in the pews, some are of the kingdom of darkness and some are of the kingdom of light. Some are the children of, of Satan and some are the children of God. The more we realize this, the more we're able and apt to make that delineation between the two and call people to go from one kingdom to another, from being children of one parent and being the child of another. We can give that call, but it is only God who draws the spirit who enables, the spirit that regenerates, the spirit that gives the gifts of faith and repentance, and then those who do, in fact, go through that process are the all 
who received him are the ones who believed in his name and are the ones who become the children of God. This is serious stuff, folks. For you preachers out there listening, this is the gospel. This is the delineation of faith, not in and of ourselves and our ability to quote-unquote choose God, but in fact realize that it is the Father that draws and that the great promise of Christ is that they will be raised in the last day. But the ones that did receive him, the ones that do believe in his name, they have become the children of God. That those that hunger and thirst after righteousness, the Sermon on the Mount, in whom Jesus gives his body and his blood, not only to redeem, but to satisfy that spiritual need. This language of faith in the New Testament is not only broad, but it's also specific. It's broad in its possible application. All, to all, whosoever believes, the pasapasuan, whoever are the believing ones, will have eternal life. But to all who did receive him, yes, the word all is there, pas in the Greek, but the qualifier is that did they in fact receive him? Or, as we talked about last week, did they just have spiritual heartburn? Did, did they have bad pizza the night before? Had a couple spicy meatballs. Hey, Brother Malcolm. No, I understand I haven't forgotten. Plus, it's a little early this morning. I know you watch. No biggie. But this spiritual reality, especially for those who preach and teach the word, to realize that it is not the work of man, realizing that it's not an intrinsic ability of man, it is God who calls, it is the God who justifies, and the God who glorifies. Oh, you mean, Pastor Chris, that kind of sounds like Romans chapter 8? Yeah, kind of sounds like Romans chapter 8. The one who ordains or the one who predestines, who justifies, who glorifies, who calls us to, in fact, being... Stupid spider. To sanctification and our future glorification. These things are the truth of the gospel. And that when this is not presented, it becomes a different gospel. If it becomes, well, you're good enough and you're smart enough and doggone it, God just has to like you, is not a gospel message. The gospel message is we're dirty, rotten, scoundrels, sinners, stink sinners, as Dr. H says, in need of a savior. And that if in fact you are actually hearing the message of the gospel, that it is God that is drawing you. That it is the spirit that is working in your life, regeneration and giving of you faith and repentance. And that if in fact you did receive him, if you did believe in his name, you are now gone from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light, from the kingdom of uh, being a child of Satan to being a child of God. We must be careful about the language that we use. It makes a difference in the gospel that we preach. It can go from being the gospel like we see in 1 John of Serithius, of presenting a different Jesus, as Paul warns about in uh, Colossians chapter 1. We must be clear to present the language of faith and the language of the gospel clearly, succinctly, to calling people to faith, not in themselves and in their abilities, but in what God has done. With that, stay tuned. Uh, about 10 minutes, we'll be back up for church history. 
um, looking at early reformers and the pushback of anti-biblical doctrine, especially regarding um, communion in the next hour. With that, God bless you and keep you as my prayer. And I look forward to seeing you guys here in the next hour. Bye, y'all.